Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of our month of Azure Databricks. Today what we're going to look at is how you get started working with notebooks. Pretty much all of the development that you're going to do inside Azure Databricks is going to be done through a notebook. If you're a data scientist, if you're a data engineer or you're a data analyst, pretty much everything you're going to be looking at will be handled through a, through a notebook. So that could be your development workloads, it could even be your production workloads. So let's have a quick look at a notebook. So I've created a notebook here, which is intended to kind of showcase a couple of different options that you have available to you. So what you can see here is this notebook is heavily inspired by the Jupyter Notebook standard. And if you actually look at what gets produced, this is a Jupyter Notebook. It has an IPython extension and it, it operates very much like a Jupyter Notebook. Now that said, there are some Databricks optimizations in here that make it a little bit easier to work with when you're working with Apache Spark. So we'll have a look at those in a moment. So hopefully what you can see here is what we've got is we've got a mixture of different cells available to us. So that first cell, the one that I'm currently highlighting now, that shows us a mixture of a couple of different elements that we can use here. So I'm combining a bit of HTML and a bit of Markdown to give this header and to give us some way to sort of tell what's happening inside this notebook. So if I double click into here, what you can actually see is this notebook is made up, this sorry, this cell is made up of Markdown and some HTML injected in there to give you that image and to give you that text. And we're doing a couple of different things here. So we've got a header, we've got a H1, which is that single hash, a header two and a header three, um, just to show a bit of, you know, a bit of variance in the kind of styles that you can do with, with Markdown. So to run cells, you have a couple of different options. You've got this guy at the top here, if you want to run everything, or if you want to run a cell individually, you've got two different options. You can either choose control enter. So if I click into this cell here, I can do control enter and that runs that cell, but it keeps me in the cell that I was on. Or if I click into it again and I do shift enter, that's going to run that cell and take me to my next cell. Now, in order to get these cells to show Markdown, what I've had to do is I've had to tell Databricks that I want it to render Markdown and not just code. So these are the kind of options that you have. Do you want to do some code or do you want to do Markdown? So what I've done is I've told Databricks that this cell is going to be Markdown and basically treat anything in it as text. Don't try and render it as code. So I've done that by using a little bit of magic. Now that's not kind of like uh, pixie fairy dust magic. Magic is the term that we use to basically tell a notebook that we're going to be using a different language or to do something um, different. So we've got a couple of different magic keywords that we can use. The first one there that I've looked at is percentage MD and that's saying treat this cell as markdown. Then we also have things like percentage FS for saying you're going to be using the um, the Databricks utilities file system options. We've got SH for doing shell commands. Then we've got the ones for changing a notebook to a different language. And so this is one of the really interesting things that you can do with Databricks is you can create a notebook which is multi-language. So you could have a, a notebook which ba its base language is Python. So this one, when it was created, was selected to say the base language that we're looking at here is Python. But then I could also say, well, this next cell, I need it to be Scala and I'll use some Scala code. Then I might create a table and say, well, actually what I want to do is I know how to do this particular part very well in SQL. So I'm going to do that in SQL. And I'd come back and I just change that and say use SQL. Or I could use um, R as well in there and I can choose which one I want to do. Now, the question that we always get asked is, well, OK, you know, what's the negative of having a multi-language notebook? And from an operational point of view, from actually running this, you know, there's no real drawback from doing that. The real problems that you're going to get to is, you know, you don't want to be the person that has to then try and support your notebook when you've left, given that you've got like four different language in, languages in there all doing different things. That's going to be awful for the developer who picks your work up. So if you can do it in one language, just do it in one language. So let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at an example. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to use our percentage FS. This is saying I want to do a file system type task. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an LS. So I'm going to do a list of all of the files that I have in that particular folder. So if I run this, what you can see here is that that LS on a mount point. So we'll talk about mount points in a future video. 
um, but what I can see there is all of the files that I have available to me. So moving down, we can have a look at a couple of optimizations that we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this next cell here and all this cell is doing is it's taking that file that we originally looked at from our listing command and it's going to load it into a data frame and it's just going to cache that data frame in memory. So I'm sending that to the cluster and via the magic of the internet we've sped that up and now what you can see there is you've got a couple of things in here. So when that finished running you've got these little drop downs. So if I zoom in here what we can see is um, it created two Spark jobs and then we can also see this, this little optimization here which will show us the schema. So I can come and I can click in here and I can actually see the jobs that were executed. And the reason why we've got two there is basically because we've got this um, option here for inferring schema, which is going to do two operations, one to read that schema and another one to actually then read in the data. So if I click on this one here, we can also see the schema that's been inferred from this file. So we can see here the, the headers that we have. Now moving down, now this has been cached, we can um, choose to display this. So this is the first optimization that you'll really see is you've, you've got this keyword display and display is a really nice way of rendering your nice structured tabular data. Um, as well as rendering structured tabular data, it can also render images and things like that very well. And you have an option for display HTML, which will display you HTML. So what you can see here is you can see that data. If I um, scroll along a little bit, you can see we've got our pickup time there, our drop off date time. And we've got a whole load of other things there. Now, one of the other things that you have here is I run this again. Again, this is just reading this data straight from cache is I've got this option down here and I can decide, do I want to visualize this as a tabular format? Or do I want to visualize this as, um, as an infographic, as some kind of data visualization? So if I click on here, what we can now see is a bar chart, which is showing me the most common um, dispatching base. So I can see here that B00937 is the most common dispatching base. And then I can come in here and I can choose my various different plot options for how I want to do that. Maybe I want to change this away from dispatching base number to um, pickup base or something like that. What was the pickup location? Now, the last thing I want to show you with notebooks is how you go about importing a notebook that somebody else has created. Maybe what you want to do is you're going to want to run through this notebook. So I'll show you how you do that. Now, you go on the Internet and you're looking around for something that's going to help the problem that you have. Maybe that's you're trying to do some deep learning with Keras and you want to know how to do an inference script. So you Google it and you find this article here, how you do distributed model inference using Keras. Now, I don't want to run this through the Databricks website. What I want to do is I want to copy all of this and I want to start running it on my version of my cluster of um, Databricks. So I could go through here and I could try and copy out every single item in here and paste it into a notebook and that's just going to take me forever. Or I could click up here, get a notebook link. And if I click on that, then that's going to show me this screen here, which has the full notebook in it. And I have this option up here, import notebook. So if I click on that, it's going to give me a link. If I copy that link out and go back over to my um, Databricks, if I go back home, come down to my um, Databricks folder here. What I have down here is this option for import. And I can say what I want to do is I want to import a notebook from a URL, paste in that URL, hit import. And then there we go. We have that version of that notebook ready for us to start working through. I can attach it to my cluster and I can start trying to run through some of these examples.